Case number one was suggested by M. Happy. Welcome to Mrs. True Crime. Today's video is an in-depth look into the disappearance of Megan McCollum and Caitlin Kearney. It's a tale of illness and substance abuse. If you're triggered by anything dealing with unanswered questions, feel free to click off this video. Perhaps check out a bunny video for some lighthearted content. If not, I'm Nicole. Let's get started. According to the Courier Post, between 14,000 to 16,000 people are reported missing in New Jersey, and almost all are found, yet currently 1,000 cases remain unsolved. NJ.com states that 900 of these cases are classified as long-term missing person cases, meaning they've been missing for over 30 days. The website continues that state police have 310 unidentified human remains and that these cases may overlap. As of May 2018, the state of New Jersey has hosted two Missing in New Jersey events. Both events were hosted by New Jersey State Police and are attended by family and friends of those who have yet to be found. However, the events are open to the public. The event's goal is to bring the families together while also supplying DNA, photos, and dental records to police to assist in their investigation. But families don't stop at the event. They trend their missing relatives on Twitter, post and hand out flyers, and create groups on Facebook. One of the groups belongs to Megan McCollum, created by her mother. At 3.30 a.m. on Wednesday, March 11, 2015, at 10 John Street, Montvale, New Jersey, Betty Sato heard the barks of her granddaughter's pit bull, Sweet Pea. Her granddaughter loved the dog. She rescued him from the side of a highway in South Carolina on the way to a Pish concert. She took the dog practically everywhere. From short stays at her parents to work at Visiting Angels, Sweet Pea never left Megan's side. But on March 11th, Sweet Pea was alone. The dog started to bark, Betty recalled in a phone interview. I got out of bed. I looked in the bedroom. The room was empty. She was gone. She left in a hurry. She had my front door key. She left it in the normal place by the door. And it's still there. Along with her missing granddaughter was also her granddaughter's car, wallet, and phone. Everything else was in its place. When Megan failed to show up at work after days of silence, a search began. The search focused primarily on her black 1998 Subaru Impreza. It was believed that they found the car, they would find Megan, and for a brief moment, they did. About a month after her disappearance, her car was located in Log Branch in the parking lot at Pier Village. The location is approximately an hour and a half away from her grandmother's home, according to Google Maps. Video footage showed Megan arriving around 5.30 a.m. the day of her disappearance and walking in the direction of the boardwalk. This is the last footage of her. She left behind her ID, wallet, cell phone, and car keys, all of which were inside her vehicle. Her car remained unattended for four weeks in a parking garage until it was stolen and purchased. Authorities made three arrests in accordance to the car, but they do not believe they are connected to Megan's disappearance. With the car found and Megan still not located, it was critical to retrace Megan's steps and days leading to her vanishment. Megan, as described by her parents Heidi and James, was a free spirit. She bathed in empathy and compassion and strived to help others. She adored the arts, music, and the outdoors. Her passion for creativity guided her to attend and graduate Montclair State University with a degree in English, but she pursued a career in social work. She was a very special person, said Heidi. If you were a part of her life, she really touched you in a way that you would not forget. Megan spent the majority of her time volunteering at different organizations such as City Green that focused on building urban farms and gardens in northern New Jersey, and Eva's Kitchen, now Eva's Village, a program to feed the homeless. Around 2013, Megan applied to Visiting Angels, a living assistance service for the elderly. 
When Megan interviewed, she was so effervescent, said Beth Nelson, owner of Visiting Angels. She was really thrilled and looking forward to taking care and working with the elderly. In her will to help others, Megan battled her own demons. Six years prior to her disappearance, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and her medication wasn't her favorite thing to take. She suffered, Heidi shared. She had breakdowns. There were attempts to take her life. Along with her suicide attempts, Megan would leave home for hours without anyone knowing where she was. But, according to her father, she was always found within two days. Around five months prior to her disappearance, Megan stopped taking her medication. This began a disagreement between her and her parents, but they soon thought of it as an effort by Megan to reclaim her mind and body. She wanted to try one more time to get off the meds, said Heidi. She wanted to live as Meg. Living as Meg meant moving out of her parents' house and in with her grandmother, but her stay was just four days and then Meg would be gone. If she had been here a little longer, I could have talked her into going back on her medication, Betty stated. She didn't like the medication, the way it made her feel. Betty's home was always a safe space for Megan, as she lived with her for nine months two years previously. According to Betty, on the weekend of March 7th, Megan was out all day Sunday. She went to work as normal Monday and Tuesday, but Tuesday night she behaved differently. How different is uncertain, but enough to raise her grandmother's eyebrow. Around the same weekend, Megan spoke to her younger brother, Glenn. He states they were planning a vacation to North Carolina for the summer, and Megan was in high spirits about it. The night before she vanished, she stopped at her parents' house and picked up her phone charger. After that, the remnants of what happened are hazy. The last ping on Megan's cell phone was at Montville, and her Gmail accounts and social security number haven't been used since she went missing. Her mother stated that it's possible Megan may not have been herself when she left her grandmother's home that morning. It's difficult to engage, to pursue the search for her, James said in an interview in February 2016. When I found out her car was down the shore, I drove thousands of miles. I was all over that place for a month. I went down to Camden, Atlantic City, everywhere. It's just exhausting. But you're driven by the hope that, you know what? They haven't found her yet, so she's probably still out there. It's unknown why Megan drove to Long Branch. Though Reddit users speculate she may have committed suicide in the ocean, investigators released bloodhounds, searched the boardwalk, and deployed rescue boats to scan the area, but have never found any leads regarding Megan's whereabouts. One article stated that Megan was apparently going on a date that night, but no other source has confirmed this. Megan McCollum is 5'3", between 170 to 210 pounds, brown eyes and brown hair. She wore soft contacts, had noticeable wrist scars, a tattoo on her foot of a lotus flower with a black spider, and a tattoo on her lower right back of a dolphin and castle. She was last seen wearing a light brown shirling type jacket, short sleeve shirt, black skirt, and boots. Anyone with information regarding her or her whereabouts is urged to call Oakland Police Department at 201-337-6171. Caitlin Kearney wanted to do right by her daughter, her family, and mostly herself. She wanted to get her life back on track, but she was battling a drug addiction, a battle she was losing. According to drugabuse.gov, an addiction is a quote, chronic disease characterized by drug seeking and use that is compulsive or difficult to control despite harmful consequences, unquote. The website further states that it can affect the brain's quote, reward circuit, causing euphoria, as well as flooding it with the chemical messenger dopamine. Surges of dopamine in the reward circuit cause the reinforcement of pleasure, but unhealthy behaviors like taking drugs, leading people to repeat the behavior again and again." Unquote. As drug usage increases, the brain adapts to the behavior, making it harder to quit. Caitlin's mother, Denise Urovic, stated, her drug addiction progressed quickly, and for me it seemed like things happened fast. She went from abusing prescription drugs, and it just took off from there. Denise recalled that her and her then 20-year-old daughter were very close. She described her as a, quote, a great kid and full of life and really smart, unquote. It wasn't until Caitlin became pregnant and her drug addiction escalated that the two hit a rough patch. Caitlin and her then newborn daughter Lily moved in with her grandmother and Ariel, trying to treat her drug problem. 
Caitlin stayed with her grandmother for around two months in 2012. But the relationship hit a sour note when Caitlin, quote, cleaned out a chunk of her grandma's bank account, unquote. Caitlin entered the home April 2012 and overheard her grandmother talking, upset, about the incident. Instead of pleading her case, Caitlin turned around and walked out of the door. That was the last time her grandmother, mother, or daughter saw her. Over the course of four months, sightings and paper trails of Caitlin kept her family in the know that she was at least okay. The timeline was as follows. In May 2012, a month after Caitlin left her family, Denise reported Caitlin's car stolen and she was picked up by police outside a Beermore motel. According to authorities, she'd fallen into the wrong crowd. During this month and a few later, Denise received solicitations from lawyers and failure to appear notices. In late June 2012, Caitlin's cousin Dan Jurevic Axkelberg and his wife met up with her. We were trying to press upon her that there was a path out and that people loved her, he says. They spent 30 hours together, watching TV, eating pizza, and walking to Center City. Even though she was going through a lot, she was obviously the same person, he says. She was the same smart firecracker who loved her daughter and talked about her consistently. Caitlin was in place in the Philadelphia Rehab Center, though it only lasted a few days. But Dan classified the text between the two as encouraging. In July 2012, Caitlin's best friends claimed she texted them that she was being held against her will in Camden. Denise drove around Camden in search of her daughter, but investigators in Gloucester County couldn't confirm that Caitlin's hostage story was true. Meanwhile, during this time, Dan continued to receive messages from Caitlin. Though she was sad that she left rehab, we left on good terms, he says. She talked about going back, oftentimes to rehab. Rehabilitation can take a number of tries to stick. So I think hopefully that that's what she wanted. She talked a lot about the safety and the happiness of her daughter, that eventually it would stick. After some time, the messages began to change and Dan realized he was no longer speaking to his cousin. Whoever was on the other line was unconnected to Caitlin, though the service still provides the same outgoing message. The police tell me that they do that, says Yerevic, who has tried calling as well. They sell the phone, someone picks up the phone, they continue to pay for it, but can't change the message. There's a lot of questions in my mind that are unanswered. After a while, mail from the courts and sightings of Caitlin began to dwindle. And on September 4th, 2012, Denise reported Caitlin missing. There's a huge empty space in my heart, Denise says. A lot of times I guess I get by with denial, but it's especially hard around her birthday. Lily gets me through it. She gives me a reason to go on, Denise said in a 2015 interview. What they teach is you can't really help an addict and you can't rescue them, she says. You have to help yourselves, and they have to do what they have to do. It's a generation of entitled children, and they have to learn the hard way, I guess. But what happens when the hard way doesn't work? About the years of silence and the unknown about Caitlin, Dan had this to say. It's strange because you want to hope for the best, but it's now been years, Yervik Askelberg says. At the same time, we have a really cute reminder of her and her daughter, who looks a lot like her who has the same personality, a lot of the same spunk. I think everybody is pretty devastated. At the same time, there's Lily. It's been impossible to look at Lily and not see Caitlyn. Now, here's where things get a bit, um, weird. The last interview I could find was with Caitlyn's mother, Denise, in 2015. Jump ahead two years and I found a memorial page with an obituary for Caitlyn posted in 2017. The odd factor is that there's a two-year gap in between these posts. I couldn't locate anything about whether or not Caitlin's body was found, or if she came home, or anything of the sort. In fact, her missing persons profiles on the Charlie Project, I Have Vanished, and other missing persons websites are still active. While reading a few of the comments on the obituary, I learned that Caitlin had a second daughter. There are photos of Caitlin after she delivered her, according to the captions. Yet, the second child has never been mentioned in any article or source I could find. In an interview with her mother, she only mentions Lily. It's possible Caitlin came back and had another child, or that the daughter was living elsewhere. I'm not sure. Still, the missing persons database is treating Caitlin as a missing person, and so I would do the same. Caitlin is 5 feet, approximately 110 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes. She has a tattoo of a strawberry on her lower left abdomen 
and a C-section scar. Her nose may be pierced. Anyone with information is encouraged to call 856-589-3500. There are, at most, 900,000 people reported missing each year. Of that number, 50,000 are over 18. Half of them are white, 30% are African American, and 20% are Latino. Those suffering from any kind of addiction or mental disorder are unfortunately the bulk of missing adults. The National Alliance on Mental Illness lists seven things to do as someone you know who suffers from a disorder goes missing. They are as follows. One, contact the police immediately. If the person remains missing for more than three days, ask the police to place them on the National Crime Information Center, NCIC, as an endangered adult. Two, reach out to the missing person's friends and acquaintances. Three, register them with the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, name us. Four, check nearby hospitals, churches, libraries, and homeless shelters. Five, post a one-page flyer including two recent photos, their name, hometown and state, height, weight, age, vehicle plate number and car of applicable, place last seen, and phone number of police. Six, check on social media or create a website slash blog. And seven, alert the local media. If the media covers the story, it can lead to other resources and witnesses that may not have been available. Megan and Caitlin suffered from a disorder and addiction respectively and want to reclaim their mind and body again. It's just sad to think as they tried to get their life back on track, they vanished from their families. I miss a true crime. I remember to be kind, be loud, be aware. For more information about Megan McCollum and Caitlin Kearney, why not check out some of these awesome links? And if you like what you saw and heard today, why not drop a like and a comment? Maybe subscribe while you're here? <laughs> I make new videos every Wednesday. And you don't want to miss what's in store.